Hello, welcome to Hope Church Harrogate's message of the week. If you'd like to connect with us, please head over to hopeharrogate.co.uk forward slash connect. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, um, I'm just going to read the, the Bible verse for this morning before Rachel comes up to preach. And it's from 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 to 13, if you'd like to turn with us in your Bibles. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not taste Christ as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I'm Rachel, and uh, I get to preach today, which I'm always very excited about, you guys. Uh, We'll find the tone in a second. Uh, Today, we're continuing our gallop through 1 Corinthians. Some of you can't remember when we ever didn't reach out of 1 Corinthians. And don't worry, more is coming. We're seeing at least through the end of the year, right? Yes. We're taking a break. We're having a little Jesus break uh, in the summer. I don't want to spoil any. No spoilers. Uh, Yes. But do you remember back in the day when we were on Psalm 23? That was ages ago. So we are now in 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, and so this passage is jumping in here. And uh, it begins with a big reminder of stories. Now, stories are something that we as a community, as a culture, historically sort of carry together. For instance, if we, now we all in here from lots of different nations uh, and places, uh, as you can tell by accents and things. Uh, But if I put up, for example, my first slide, this one, before I moved to this country, you could have looked at me and said 1066, and I would have no idea what you were talking about. I move here now, and if you look at me and say 1066, I'm like, Battle of Hastings, right? Like there's something mm, from the Norman invasion. I can even talk about Harold's murder and the other Harold something something and William. See, I know lots. Uh, but, you know, you look at 1066, we all at least know there's something having to do with the battle and invasion. There is a shared story that we can reference and we pull up some sort of picture of that dude in our head. Right? If I flashed this picture at you, what would you say? How many wives did he have? Can you tell me the sequence? Ooh. Still, you might not know all the details. Divorce, beheaded, died. Divorce, beheaded, survived. Um, and those of you who have seen six can stand up and sing a song for us. Maybe at the end, Adam says, we might get a little preview of Six the Musical from Adam later. There is a shared collective story that we can reference. And so if somebody says in conversation, 
not like you have six wives. We could all be like <laughs> Henry VIII because it's a reference to a story that we know. Now, we all share that sort of general knowledge and understanding. Now, not all of us always share the same stories. For instance, this will pull out a very niche group of people. Now, if anyone is a Star Trek fan like me, can anyone yell the thing that you're supposed to yell when you see this? <gasps> oh! And now we're going to have a church split right here, right now. When you see this, you should scream while crying, there are four lights. It was a torture scene. It was a whole thing. Chain of command, part two. Uh, Star trek -y fans will know this well. It is canon. But not every one of you will know this. There are other groups of people who have shared histories. May I see the next slide? Can you name me what that is? I had to Google Lord of the Rings thing, and that came up. But a whole bunch of people instantly, eyes in God. And they can reference it, and they can reference the big tree coming and fighting, because they share a story. And what Paul is doing in this at the beginning is he is calling on a shared story, which is why for some of you, you feel like you're lost at the first section of this reading because you're like, what is he talking about? Now, if you're ever reading the Bible and you feel like they're referencing something and I don't know, I would suggest you may not have explored this. If you're new to faith or new to Bibles or new to big, thick Bibles, um, sometimes what they have are cross references in that. And so you'll notice even in the reading, can we go back to the, the reading? Uh, and there was one like little tiny blue in the next one. See those little blue little dot things in between there? Those are cross-references or bottom things. And so when you're reading, sometimes you, you just learn to ignore all of those things. And what they are is they're telling you what they're talking about. And so they'll cross-reference. They'll say, here's another Bible verse because that's what he's actually talking about. So when you're reading, it's really easy to go down a rabbit hole of um, what is that about? And then you flip back. And then you read that story and you're like, that's crazy. Oh, wait, there's another footnote. And then you're into another story and you're down this happy little rabbit hole. And so do that. I just want to encourage you to do that because that is really helpful. And so what, what Paul is doing here is he's talking about collective stories that the Jewish people shared. Now, what I find fascinating in this is that when Paul was writing, he wasn't just writing to a Jewish population. He was writing to people who were not Jewish people and who were Jewish people. So he was kind of doing the Lord of the Rings reference thing because half of them were like, I don't know what you're talking about. I became a Christian three weeks ago and I have no Jewish background. And so he was referring to stories that some people might not have known. And um, what I find interesting in that is that was a common debate at the time. When you were becoming a Christian and you weren't a Jewish person, there was a big debate about should you become a Jewish person and get circumcised and like go down the whole Jewish thing? And that was a whole common debate that was happening. And so therefore, is Jewish stories in the past even helpful to new Christians? It was a, a thing that evidently was um, sort of present in that whole conversation. And I find sometimes nowadays, we also have that view. How many of you have read the entire Old Testament from the beginning to the end of the Old Testament. Some of us, not all of us. Some of us get stuck in numbers. We're just like, oh my goodness, it's so hard to get through numbers. Uh, some of you hit the prophets and you're like, this feels really repetitive. Uh, it, is, it is sometimes feels like the Old Testament is a thing. That's the past. We're Christians. We want the New Testament. We like it. Uh, and Paul was, was referencing something because dead people have things we can learn from too. And evidently, he felt like those people's journeys were not just so that we could achieve what we are achieving now, but so that we can learn from them. I think there's something really interesting about learning from other people's lives. It is a natural part of what we do. We are fascinated by other people's lives, by other people's experience. Reality TV would not be interesting if we weren't interested in other people's lives and other people going through circumstances that we don't have to. <laughs> they have some really interesting reality TV shows out there that we're not going to go down. 
Don't they have one? Now, this is just now, this is nothing. Don't they have one where you just get dropped naked on an island? Isn't there something like, yes. <laughs> um, and there's, there's one where you, they isolate people in their own little apartments and then they have to try to catfish each other and try to make different online personas and convince each other. There are so many different online, so many different reality shows. And we love, we are fascinated by watching real people encounter danger and navigate situations because it's so interesting to watch someone else go through it. And I find I learn from other people all the time. I was speaking at a conference last weekend about church planting. And um, we just, just sat there, like just looking at each other and listening to their stories and just thinking, oh, that's fascinating. And I want to learn from that. And gosh, I'm really challenged deeply now. And it was just so interesting to learn from each other's stories. And Paul is saying there is a gift for us in the Old Testament of stories that we often don't tap. And that is really, really important for us. Because in church community, we talk a lot of testimonies and sharing our stories and sharing who God is for us now. And the Old Testament people can seem very, very far away and very different than who we are. And Paul was saying to this community of Jewish people and, and non-Jewish people, some of you have these stories that are actually are all of our heritage of faith. And for those of you who weren't raised in the Jewish faith, these are important stories for you too, because God is giving them to you as an example of something important for you to grasp. And so um, the Old Testament, if you don't know this, there's an Old Testament slide that I just wanted to show, because often we don't talk about it. Uh, the Old Testament has a bunch of different books in them, uh, lots of different ones. And uh, they have some that are like law books. I would say there's some history in the law, but Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy have lots of stories, but they also have sort of the Old Testament law in them. You've got some history books in there that are those middle ones, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. Some of them overlap in their storytelling, but those are some history books. There's some poetry books. You ever open up to the middle and you're like, wow, there's a really emotional guy talking about his feelings. That's in the middle. That's in Psalms, uh, and that's some poetry books, or you have some, as Adam read out loud, was it in here where you read Song of Solomon out loud? And you all got to really enjoy your dulcet tones of reading poetry. Oh, or was it the Sex and Sexuality Night? If you weren't at the Sex and Sexuality Night, you missed Adam reading to you from Song of Solomon, and which was an experience for us all. And it was, <laughs> it was relaxing. He'll release an audio book later. And uh, the, the fourth type are prophecy books of people who listened to God and were talking to nations and talking to individuals and sharing the words from God for those people. And so when you're flipping through the Old Testament, they're, they're not organized like that. They're sort of sometimes chopping and changing and mixing. But those are the different types of things we have in the Old Testament that sort of help you with that. And what Paul was referring to in this section is he pulled out four stories. Can I see the next slide, please? So the stories that Paul referenced, I'm not going to tell them to you because they're all a very interesting rabbit hole. I would encourage you to go down the track for them. Uh, but what Paul was referencing in this one was he was saying there are some Old Testament stories of examples for us about something specific. And he was mentioning things like idols at the time that people <laughs> left Moses went up and they're like, Moses, abandon us. I know what we should do. Make an idol. And so made an idol and decided to worship it. He was talking about them willfully sinning. They knew it was wrong, and they chose to start sexual immorality anyways. They started judging God, where they began to say, God, why did you do this? You brought us to a place with no bread. That was stupid. I can't believe you did that. Um, they started turning on each other and um, beginning to really go at each other in terms of that. There were these stories that Paul referenced, which seem really far away. Well, we're not living with tens of thousands of people in a field somewhere trying to get our food from heaven. So I don't know what those stories have to do with us. Um, but actually, these are very real stories with very real people facing very real fears and being tempted in very real ways. When I look at this kind of stuff, we look and we say, well, we're not randomly tempted to be like, I know what I want to do on Friday, make a golden calf and worship it. Like we're like, that's, that's an idol that I'm thinking I'm safe from. 
But are there times in our life where we are tempted in a feeling out of control of what's going on around us that we choose to center and worship ourselves rather than God? Are we tempted to, um, to idolize health over idolize our relationship with God? Do we idolize my life going well rather than idolizing becoming, rather than pursuing becoming more like Christ? Are there times where rather than pursuing who God is, we put something in front of it and then say, this is easier to dedicate my life to than God? I would suggest that's a temptation we all do. And so what happened to them and how did they handle that temptation? And, and what, how did God respond and what happened to God's heart in response to that? That's a very real and important story. Does that make sense? The, the willfully sinning. <laughs> Are there times where we're like, yeah, you know what? I want to I wanna live life with God and also really want this thing that my body wants. And so therefore, I know it's wrong. I'm going to do it anyway. Is that something that we do sometimes? Yeah. How do we handle that? And how does God respond? Are we ever tempted to look at God and say, why did you choose to do this? Why have you brought me here? Why have you done this? Your plan isn't good enough for me. Are we ever tempted to judge God? I would argue, yeah. Are we ever tempted to look how our life is turning out and turn to other Christians and other people around us and say, it's your fault why I'm here? And I don't think you're good. I don't think that you are someone that is worthy, is smart, is worth following. Are we easily turning on each other in a faith community? I think we do sometimes. There's a lot of temptation out there. And, um, and I would like to learn from people who've done it so that I don't have to walk the same path. Does that make sense? It is a gift. The Old Testament is a gift to us. And Paul is saying, um, read it, <laughs> learn from it, because there is something really significant about how people handle temptation that we can learn from. These are examples for us to learn from. Now, I usually only like having one point, but I couldn't not have this point, which is this. There is among Christians, a, well, around just people in general, a common phrase that you may have heard. God will never give you more than you can handle. How many have ever heard that phrase? Okay. I have seen it to try to comfort someone. I have seen people try to assure people with it. And I just want to say publicly... It is heretical. The Bible does not say that. The Bible not once says that. Uh, it is not a thing. And so often we use it as a thing. And it is not a thing. And we put our feet on it. And we're like, I trust that God's giving all me all these horrible things because he thinks I'm good enough to handle all of this pressure. That is not a thing. It's not a thing. No. Oh, just wanted to say it. I, was, I spent ages trying. I just wanted a big sound that was like, ah, ah, no. It's not what the Bible says. Where do they get it from? They get it from this verse, though. And so if we go back, there we go. She is so good. Um, gets this verse. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Thank you. I think, I think, there we go. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Mm -hmm. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Well, that's a horse of a different color now, isn't it? I, I think it's so important, this, because there, there are reasons why we get a false and warped view of God, and it's little phrases like this. And if we are like, God will never give me more than I can bear, then we're saying every terrible thing that I have in my life is a gift from God, because he thinks I'm super strong. And that is not the foundation of who God is. God is saying that thousands of years before Paul, people were experiencing temptation and handled it in different ways. And the people then, 2,000 years ago from now, are experiencing temptation and handling it different ways. And we are experiencing temptation and handling it in many different ways. And he has something to say about what that is. And I am so intrigued by this because right in the middle of this sentence about temptation, 
which we often think rests on us. You're being tempted, sort it out. And I love that right in the middle of this temptation phrase is God is faithful. God is faithful in the midst of the humanness of being tempted in life. I find that fascinating. Why would they anchor? Why would he anchor that in there? No temptation has overtaken you except what was common to mankind. I love that sentence because it's basically like whatever you're tempted in, you're not alone. It's happened for thousands of years. Get over yourself, which I think is really helpful because so often when you're faced with temptation, you're like, I'm a horrible person and I'm unique and different than everyone else in the world. And actually, this is the human condition, people. Welcome to life. And I think that is so helpful for him to say. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. There's a truth that says whatever circumstance you're in, whatever temptation is pulling at you, whether it is to just put down God and worship something else, worship yourself, worship what you want in your life, whether it is a temptation to separate yourself from God and be like, you don't know what you're doing whether it's a temptation to just pursue your own desires, whether it's a temptation to separate yourself from others, that can feel overwhelming. But God's faithfulness is that there will always be a way out. You do not have to walk that path because there is a, a God path, a big blinking light that is saying, walk towards holiness, walk towards goodness, and this is how you can do it. In the depths of temptation, you are not alone. And I think that is so significant because I think we often picture God from really far away being like, well, I hope you do what you're supposed to. And him just watching to see what you've done. And he's in the middle of it with you being like, I'm faithful. That's the pathway. That's the pathway. You got this. That's the pathway. There is a, a partnership and a kindness in it that I think is really, really important. Um, and this happens in so many different ways. There was a, a time, there was a time where I was, I, I, I would say, I think all of us have a predilection to a certain, like, I don't think this is in any way accurate for many other people. I know there's a thing in me that like that I'm constantly really wary of in terms of temptation for me, which is pride. Like whole lifetime, I am like, I've got to watch my pride. And um, I was running a conference with a really big Christian speaker. Like one of those Christian speakers were like, oh my God! I'm like, I'm going to totally like freak out and fangirl in front of this guy. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get to share a stage. It's going to be amazing. And then for the rest of my life, I'll be like, oh yeah, I sure shared a stage with this person. It's going to be so good. And God was like, God and I were I was just eating breakfast. And God was like, uh, God was like, you could do that. Or you could hand that over to other people. Never tell anybody that you led a conference with that person and never even meet them. What would you choose to do? And I was like, this is a tough decision. <laughs> because I want to be like, oh, yeah, we went out to lunch and we had a conversation. And we talked and we platformed and there will be pictures with us together, mm, leading Holy Spirit ministry together. And I'll be able to forever. Or I could gift that to other people and I could never have that experience and walk a path of holiness. And I was so tempted, I was so tempted, and I did the right holy path, and it was really good for my heart, and it was important for me, and it was so much more helpful to walk with God, to follow that path than the thing I really wanted to do. There was a, a time where I used to um, process my emotions, uh, and I'd process my emotions with all of the emotions that I had. So I'd come home and I'd be like, that person is an absolute idiot. Like, abs like, what is they thinking? And I can't believe, and I'd process all of my emotions with all of the actual thoughts I had. And then I'd get to the point where I'd be like, but Jesus loves them. And maybe that, you know, maybe they should be, you know, I'll forgive them. Like, I'd get to the holy point after I had my vomit of everything that I wanted to say about that person. And I was so, and I realized that that was so not good for my heart because I would be like, thinking those things all throughout the day so that I can then get home and process those with my husband and then process those with God and then get there. And that was like a massive reigning of my heart of disconnection from other people, other Christians. And um, 
And I was in that. And I, it was oppressive, actually, of just how much I started feeling disconnected from my fellow Christians because I was busy judging them in my head. And God said to me, I want you to process your emotions as if that other person you're processing about is a beloved child of mine. And I'm listening. And I learned <laughs> that it's a lot harder to call someone an idiot when you're looking at the person who loves them as a child <laughs> and be like, your kid's an idiot. Not every parent receives that well. And so I learned that I actually had to say, I know you love this person. And I know that they're really trying hard. And I love that you love them. And I've seen how much they've grown. But today I found their behavior difficult, God. Put my heart in a really different place than my heart of judgment. And my heart was so much healthier. And my days were so much lighter. Because of the one way out God gave me from that temptation. Now some of you are looking at me like, fine, but I'm being tempted to have an affair. Like it's not all... But I just want to say there's no, no sin is, be, is bigger or more significant than any other sin. We're, we're all walking a path of temptation. And whether it's physical temptation, whether it's emotional temptation, whether it's spiritual temptation, there are places where you feel trapped in thought patterns and spiritual centers. And God is saying you are, it is not inevitable that you give in to that. It is not inevitable that your life's struggle is this. It is not inevitable that you can't find a pathway out and you just have to give into it. There is a way of walking that I will give you a way out. You just ask and I will point to it. And I will give you a place where you can, can find a way through. Not so that it all disappears and goes away. Not that just magically that temptation finishes. But so that I can endure it. I, rem I, re I don't know if this is helpful. I didn't think about whether I'd say this out loud or not. You can laugh at me and say that was stupid. But I remember before I got married, I remember I was like, do you know how you know, we're talking about Jesus coming again? And Jesus is going to come back. And I just remember praying wholeheartedly, oh God, please delay your return until I have sex. That was like this deep, deep, Lord, please don't come back until, and I, cause I was like, please God, I really, really wanted to have that experience. But I gotta have and there was this, this overwhelming sort of sense of what I wanted in my life. There are so many times where you have these things that you just like, this is what I want. This is what my plan is. And that doesn't mean God's like, oh, tell you what, I'll just make you stop caring about that. Voila. It's erased from your brain and heart, but he gives you a way so that you can endure it. Because we're going to all walk a path of temptation in life. Jesus himself was tempted in all things, scripture tells us. But he learned how to walk the path of temptation with righteousness and holiness because God always provided a way out for him so that he can endure. What are you finding yourselves trapped in? Where are you on the edge, the, the eddy of a, of a river of your life being like, I just feel like I'm constantly swirling around this. What are the things that you constantly give into that you're like, there's no way out. It is inevitable that I am going to keep in this mind pattern, this thought pattern, this choice pattern. Where are you feeling trapped? And where do you need a faithful God to say he's not, he's not going to ever put you in a situation where you can't find your path out because he will be shining a pathway and providing a way for you so that you can endure this with holiness and well. Does that make sense? There's a God of holiness who walks in the very real, very humanness of life. I love scripture. And one of the reasons I love the Old Testament is because it is full of messy, messy people who are very imperfect, who God points to and says, wow, they are people of faith. And I think often we think of, of people of faith and people of God who are just these perfect people who never make mistakes. And some of the people that in the Old Testament that we see who God cherished the most and said, he has a heart after my own heart, were people who had affairs outside of marriage and had children outside of marriage and, and who murdered people. And these were very messy people who dealt with very real temptation that God adored and championed because of the path they walked through. And um, I can walk a, a messy path towards a better path of holiness because God is faithful in it. And so I just wanted to pray with us.
God, I thank you for the gift of the Old Testament. I thank you for the gift of generations upon generations upon generations of people who have walked with you, that we may hear their stories and we may hear their failures and we may hear their half successes, that we may learn more of who you are and how we may walk with you. I thank you for the gift of those stories. I thank you for the gift of the people around us, that we may walk side by side with them. And God, life is messy and hard. And all of us come with our particular histories of trauma and experiences that mean that our our particular shapes of heart and mind tend to different temptations that pull us away from you and pull us away from the fruitful, flourishing life that you've called us to. Not a perfect life, but a life of peace and love and joy and kindness and goodness that you've called us to. A place of fulfillment and contentedness. God, you know, I love that you know all the secret parts of our heart and our minds, not to uh, sit in judgment and slap us for it, but you look on it with a heart of compassion and wants to be faithful to us in it and help us find pathways forward to endure, to find a way out of those places. Thank you, God, that there is no shame for us to open our hearts and our minds to you and say, search my heart, oh God. God, I want you to know me and all the places of my unfinished places in my my temptations, in my imperfectness. Be the faithful God in my unfaithfulness and teach me how to walk with you. And Lord, let that be all of our prayers. I thank you that you are faithful in it. I thank you that you are compassionate to us in our temptations. And I thank you that you do not want us to live in the cycles of temptation and sin, but that you yourself have provided a way out. Turn our hearts to your large blinking light. I thank you that you do not leave us in temptation to be judged, but that you handhold us through it all. In Jesus' name. Amen.